here my I open this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. My name is Ton de Goei. I'm the pro-rector and also the chair of the uh, degree committee. First of all, I welcome Mrs. Zainab Mamdou. She will defend her academic thesis in public and her thesis is entitled The Novo Construction of Organ Agnostic Cancer Modules and Therapeutic Application. Welcome all members of the degree committee um, and in particular the two supervisors. The supervisor, Professor Harald Schmid, he is Professor of Pharmacology and Personalized Medicine at Maastricht University. And the co-supervisor is Dr. Christian Nogales Calvo, and he is also researcher in Pharmacology and Personalized Medicine at Maastricht University. And I will introduce the five opponents later during the ceremony. Um, welcome to you all here in the aula, and I also welcome all followers of the live stream. Mrs. Zainab Mamdou, may I invite you to present a summary of your thesis? Thank you. And I wish you success in the coming hour. The floor Thank is yours. Highly esteemed Pro-Rector, highly esteemed members of the Corona, dear family, friends and colleagues. In the next 15 minutes, I will present some of the work that I have performed during my PhD thesis entitled De Novo Construction of, Ca of Organ Agnostic Cancer Modules and Therapeutic Application. But first, why do we need to de novo construct cancer modules? The reason behind this is the low patient outcomes that we have seen with the current approaches. The five-year survival rate for some of the common cancers in the U.S., has only increased or improved by nearly 20 percentage since the 1970s. While this is overall promising, the rates still persist, low rates still persist for cancers like pancreatic, liver, and lung. And the rates even tend to decrease for cervical and uterine cancer. Demonstrating a fault in how we define cancers so far. Let's have a look at the status of the cancer therapy of the 154 FDA-approved drugs, 26 of these are purely cytotoxic agents, and 38 are still cytotoxic, however, they can act through a specific uh, protein. And only 85 proteins can, uh, drugs sorry, can be called targeted therapy. They act on 109 target, and when we map the list of those targets against the list of the known cancer driver genes, we only see a small overlap of 30 proteins, leaving behind more than 500 proteins without an effective therapy. With that, we have seen or proven that targeting a single gene is no longer effective. So what modulating um, canonical pathways then solve the problem? In this paper from the TCGA consortium, the authors assigned more than 9,000 cancer genes can the authors assigned more than 9,000 patients into 10 canonical pathways. The pathways are seen here on the x-axis, while the 64 histological subtype can be seen on the y-axis. And the numbers indicate how many patients have alteration in, their, in each of the pathways. The authors even give us a list of the genes in each of those pathways. As you can see, with few exceptions, almost all pathways are, are, are altered in all subtypes, indicating that none of those pathways can be solely utilized to define any of the subtypes. And while signaling modules are usually presented as distinct signaling principles, in fact, when we reanalyze those 10 pathways into the interactome, we can see that they are highly interconnected and by no means separate entities. With that, we have seen that targeting neither single targets nor canonical pathways can solve the problem. What is the alternative? Here, we propose to construct de novo protein-protein interaction modules from the interactome. And at that stage, you are probably wondering what is meant by the term disease modules. Proteins associated with a specific disease tend to interact closely to each other in the interactome, forming disease modules. Now comes the second question. How can we construct those disease modules? 
Although we believe that the approach that we have developed can be applied to all cancer types, we prefer to start with low complexity tumors such as thyroid cancer and DIBG, or in another term, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, a pediatric brain tumor. And the focus of the rest of my presentation will be on thyroid cancer to show you a step-by-step -step workflow on how to construct disease modules. The common practice is usually to select the seed genes from one of the available databases and start building the network. And when we tried to do the same, we investigated four different available uh, databases, namely COSMIC, DisGenet, GWAS Catalog, and TCGA. As you can see here in this Venn diagram, there are some overlaps, especially with the DisGenet and TCGA. However, no single gene was reported in the four databases. Also, the fact that many genes were only reported in one of those databases and not overlapping with the others. So we have reached to a conclusion that genetic databases are inconsistent. That's when we decided to perform a systematic review on meta-analysis for the selection of the seeds. From two different sources, namely PubMed and Web of Science, we were able to find 130 papers reporting more than 9,000 thyroid cancer patients. And the data collection started as shown in this table, where each column represents one of the studies included, and the numbers indicate how many patients had genetic alteration in any of those genes reported in the, on those papers. At the end of the data collection process, we found more than 18,000 genes to be associated with thyroid cancer. So we needed a way to rank them. That's when we carried out a meta-analysis to rank the genes based on their estimated frequencies. Let's pause, <clears throat> Let's pause here for a minute and go one step backward with the comparison of the databases. We also included the systematic review and meta-analysis in the comparison. As you can see, the systematic review and meta-analysis is overlapping with some of the databases. The total overlap is still zero. And to our surprise, databases like DisGenet and GWAS catalog even included more genes than those that were reported in the systematic review and meta-analysis. That said, let's go back to our workflow and continue with the steps. So at the end of the process of the systematic review and meta-analysis, we had more than 18,000 genes, and we couldn't build the network with such a huge uh, list of seeds. Otherwise, we will have all the proteins and the interactome ending in the network. So we mapped the genes from the systematic review against their estimated frequency, and we used the ELPO method to see where exactly the, the curve starts to plateau. The method yielded different uh, ELPO points, and we chose to take the last one as a cutoff and take all the genes to its left as seeds. Now that we have the seeds to build our network, we map those seeds into the interactome to build the first protein-protein interaction network, where we have basically all the proteins that are directly interacting with the seeds. This network is a giant hair pole, so we needed to make it a bit smaller. We did that by pruning out those proteins that are highly connected or that, they, that have more connection in the network, outside the network. However, still this network, as it is, is close to meaningless because we have no idea what happens that lead to the disease state and whether a mutation in this network can lead to activation, inhibition, or loss of function. And the impact of this mutation on the neighboring protein, would it up or down regulate the, the, the rest of the network? And most importantly, where in this network do we need to provide drug to inhibit or stimulate to get back to a status near to the normal state? So we needed to convert it into something that's more comprehensible. The first, st the first step was to divide it into small, smaller parts or smaller communities. We used the Lovan algorithm to do that, and we, could, we were able to find six communities, namely thyroglobulin, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase, and phosphatidyl in histol 3 kinase, the neurofibromine 1, histone methyl transferase, the mucine 16, and finally the P53 community. 
And the next step was to take each section of this network and rebuild it as a signaling module to really understand what's happening inside this network. And once we are done with the, all the section, now we have the network of all disease modules. One might still question about the disease modules, and we have those two landmark papers to explain it. The first paper is coming from the Allen Institute, where they show us how proteins are really tightly packed inside the cell, and that they are not freely moving. They can only interact with the proteins that are in their close vicinity. And the other image here is coming from Chu et al., where they give us an indication of the size of the, of, the, of the modules, or they name it clusters. They say that most of the modules would be in the size of 10 proteins, sometimes more, and rarely 50, and only one cluster was 150. So the next step in our workflow is to introduce drugs to treat or to modulate different parts of the module. And here we apply the principles of the network pharmacology, where we can target the network or each disease module with drug combination that affect different players in the network. We were able to compile a list of drugs that can target more than 40 proteins in this network. And when it comes to the patient benefit, People with the same cancer, and in this, space, in this specific case, thyroid cancer, they are no longer the same. But each patient has his or her own unique combination of disease modules that can be treated accordingly. As a proof of concept, we also map the genetic alteration of four of the thyroid cancer cell lines. And those were the disturbed module in each of those cell lines. Finally, we wanted to see the biological validation of our findings. So we took one of those cell lines, the one in the upper right, the 8505C, and we tried to apply some drug combination to see the effect. First, we used two drugs that can target different players in one of the modules affected. And here I anonymized the names because we are considering to file a patent and this session is being streamed online. So two drugs against the same modules. We used only sub threshold dose, so each one of them is not effective. It cannot inhibit by its own the growth of the cell line. And this hashed line indicates the additive effect of the two drugs when combined to each other, the expected effect of the two drugs. However, when the combination of drug was given, the effect exceeded the additive effect to a more synergistic effect. Again, but on a, another disease module with a combination of three drugs, each one alone is not effective, and with the combination, we still see the synergy. Now we wanted to test whether targeting two different modules would that also give us the synergy. So with two drugs acting on two different modules, each one of them still not effective alone. However, we indeed see the synergy with the combination. And finally, we indeed see the synergy here, even though that we are targeting two distant modules, however indirectly connected. So this is how we want to change the future of the cancer therapy. And instead of only targeting few proteins, we intend or we want to actually target all the disease modules, not only for thyroid cancer, but all for all cancers. And to conclude, Cancer therapy needs to move away from single targets and canonical pathways and focus more on the disease modules. We also wanted to shed some light on the fact that genetic databases are too unreliable compared to the gold standard systematic review and meta-analysis. And network pharmacology is indeed synergistic when compared to the conventional drug combinations. And finally, the effect of the drug repurposing can accelerate the clinical translation of uh, basic cancer research. In the end, I would like to thank my supervisors and my previous and current colleagues in here in Maastricht, our collaborators from different countries across the world, and the Egyptian Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research for offering me a PhD scholarship, and finally, the repo for eu project. Thank you for your attention. Now I give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. 
The opposition will be opened by the chair of the uh, thesis assessment committee, Professor André Dekker. He is a professor of clinical data science at Maastricht University. Professor Dekker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, let me first of all congratulate you on a, on a lovely book, a lovely thesis. It was very uh, thick, lots of papers in there, lots of information in there, and I read it with great uh, pleasure. I'd also like to congratulate you, of course, but also your team on that, and also your family, which I'm sure have supported you um, along this um, um, often difficult and long PhD, I assume. Um, my question starts with a very simple one, right? Um, and I'm going to ask you some more generic questions. So um, you say cancer therapy has to, work, has to move towards more a module-based approach, right? That's your um, uh, thesis. However, I'm in a very highly precise type of treatment, which we can you know, spatially modulate and temporally modulate, called radiation oncology, radiotherapy. And of course, there's also surgery. Those are two very big, um, also for thyroid cancer, uh, big treatment options. How does your work relate to those therapies? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the kind words and for the question. Indeed, high percentage of thyroid cancer patients, and in general, many patients who has thyroid cancer, uh, who has any kind of cancer, mm -hmm. they do benefit from the surgery. However, the surgery can sometimes cannot resect the whole thing, and we still need to give the patient chemotherapy, right? Sure. And thyroid cancer for specific, um, papillary thyroid cancer, for instance, is like the, the most known thyroid cancer, and for almost 90% of the patient, it's thyroid, it's thyroid removal or mm -hmm. thyroidectomy and yep. the radioactive iodine therapy. However, for the 10%, for the other tumors, not just the papillary thyroid cancer, but for the other subtypes, mm -hmm. there is, let's say, basically no approved treatment. There yep. are some treatment that can only target one of the genetic mutation if it's present in those patients. Right. And even with that, the low sur there is low survival rate for those patients. Just a few months. I understand. Yeah, no, I think you can actually do better than that. And surgery, I agree. But radiation, what radiation does, it, it also creates um, damage, right, to, yes. the, um, uh, to the DNA mostly. And, and if, if the tumor cell cannot repair itself quickly enough or, or good enough, then, it, then radiation is effective. So I think... What do you think about integrating that damage into your system, right? Because you can start perhaps targeting DNA repair mechanisms uh, with these modules, or could you not? DNA repair mechanism indeed appeared in our list of disease modules, and right. we could find some repurposable drug that can act on those. Yeah, I would think so. Thank you. Then another very generic question is, is when I read your thesis, um, I felt, and you can correct me if I, if I misunderstood, that um, you typically look up, look at this uh, nodules as of modules as saying, um, this is how cancer developed, right? And and this is causing cancer. These are driving genes for that. But in general, do you think that knowing the cause of something is the same as finding an effective treatment? Yes, I do think so, because if you know the, the cause and then you treat it accordingly, then you have the effect on the cause, right. not just the secondary effect that comes from the cause, right? right? Not just treating symptoms in chronic cases or in chronic disease. You Whoa. are actually targeting the cause of the, of the disease. And we don't really prefer to call them driver genes. Right. We call them the most frequently genes in this specific sure. Sure. cancer. But you agree with me if you have, I don't know, breast cancer, right? And, uh, and they can have the same cause, but if you can operate them, it's, um, you get a good result. If you can't operate them, you have a bad result, right? So it's not just the cause, it's also about, you know, how you do it, okay. Um, now, I'm also working a lot in imaging and, and in the imaging phenotype. And um, one of the questions that we have is, is, when I read your thesis that I had, is how do you instantiate for individual patients such a, a module or such a combination of modules, right, that you need? Um, so what, if I, if, I, if I would have given you 
a lung cancer patient or a thyroid cancer patient, doesn't matter. What, what information do you need to, to, to do your modeling? For, for this specific For patient. one specific patient. So if it's a new cancer type, we will do the whole workflow again until we reach to the network of the disease modules. Right, but what, what would you do? What kind of tests would you do? And is imaging important there or not, you think? According to our approach, we only focus on the genetic information. Okay. So we take the, 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 the information from the genetic sequence, let's mm -hmm. say, from the patient, right. map it to the disease modules or the network that we formulated, and right. see which ones are affected, treat them accordingly. Right. Yeah, so of course I understand that, right? But you can't biopsy everything you want, right? And, and you can't biopsy uh, continuously, right? Because that disease is not standing still. So the reason to use images is that we can have some spatial information, perhaps, you know, what clades are there inside a tumor, because a tumor is not homogeneous, right? But also, how does a tumor develop as a result of stress, whether it's one of the drugs that you have found or, or whether it's radiation? How would you incorporate that individual intratumor dynamic aspect into the model? You think that's feasible? In, in, in your approach? With the, the sequence method that we will apply for the patient, because we even, uh, like, considering to, to convert this into two clinical trial, actually, mm -hmm. for each mm -hmm. cancer type. So the, the, the type of the sequencing that we will apply, it will consider the tumor, heterogene the tumor heterogeneity. So it will not be like only one single biopsy and we assay this. We try to take several parts of the tumor and sequencing. If you can reach it, right? Yeah, yeah. But, if, yeah. but so we would like to, we hope with imaging that, because you can't biopsy everything, right, mm -hmm. in, in the clinic, right? And you can't do it continuously. You might do it once, but, you know. And so, do you think if we can find you an imaging modality or analysis that gives you some information, perhaps not as deep as you can do in sequencing, right, but somewhere close, that you can, again, with your, I would think that there's a, a relationship between the imaging phenotypes, so what you see in images, and your you know, combination of modules, right? At some point, you would expect that to be the same, because we do know that some tumors that are biologically different look different on imaging than others. Do you think that's a feasible approach to try and do that? I mean, I have seen some papers that use the, um, the AI tool or the technology right. to, to see whether we can already predict the genetic alteration or the genetic background of a tumor based on the imaging, right? right, right. However, still the specificity of those papers mm -hmm. is not, are not high enough right. to consider them as actually equal to the, to the genetic sequencing of the tumors. Okay, so you think... So you if it, the imaging really proved to be sufficient enough, then we use it. We okay. don't need to, to sequence. Okay, that'll tumor. be interesting. I think my time is up. Thank you. I'll give the word back to the proactor. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Decker. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Arjan Blokland. He is Professor of Comparative Neurosciences at Maastricht University. Professor Blokland. Thank you very much, Pro Rector. Dear candidate, um, um, also with great interest um, read your thesis, especially with respect to the network pharmacology approach that is uh, promoted by your supervisors. And it's um, really interesting and courageous to, uh, to step from more pharmacology to, to cancer uh, field. So that's really a challenge that you were facing up probably during this, uh, your work. Um, that's a really nice set of data, of, but, but, of, of, uh, but it's especially, I think, related to data sets that you created. And um, <laughs> that could be helpful maybe in the future. Um, I have many questions, um, <laughs> but let, let me uh, stay with chapter five, which is closer to the brain, where I am very interested in, of course, and it's this, um, this DIP gene, uh, DIPG um, cancer, uh, and, and especially in young children, which is a devastating uh, disease, of course. Um, and of course, that's also very interesting to have a look at and see whether we can make some improvements there. And I was reading in, um, in the table on page 176, a lot of genes that may be involved in this, uh, in this cancer type. And um, of course, 
as a neuroscientist, I was checking um, the IPG, what is that, and then uh, have a look at that. And I looked at some papers, and suddenly I came across a gene, H3K27M, which appeared to be quite interesting for this disease, but it's not in your table. Could you maybe explain me why um, did you miss that gene, or what is the reason that I do not see that in the table? Highly esteemed uh, opponent, thanks a lot for the kind words and for the question. Um, regarding the, the gene that you are mentioning, so the histone mutation is considered, let's say, in 80 or 90 percentage of the DIPG mm -hmm. patients, so it's indeed an important gene. Mm -hmm. However, the, the term that you used is not really the name of the gene. It's the name of the genetic variation that happens to it. So H3 is the name of the gene, indeed, the histone 3. However, the K27M relates to the change in the amino acid. So it's a substitution of lysine to methionine. And the genes, the H3 genes are on the list, indeed. They are the first one, histone H3.3, mm -hmm. and the third one, histone H3.1. Okay, so, so the it's... mutation happens in do, this kind of mutation uh -huh. happens in those two genes. Okay, thank you very much for clearing up because I'm not so much of a geneticist, so I yeah. maybe missed this one yet. But I was also thinking maybe um, you, you're listing a lot of genes that you find in the biopsies of these of these uh, cancerous cells, but um, but if you have a cancer, um, how are you sure that these genes are related to the cancerous cells? Because a cancer should probably consist of many other types of cells. Mm -hmm. So how can you be sure that all these genes that you list here are related to the cancerous um, uh, cells and not to maybe other cells that are found in the, in the cancer that are not relevant for the, uh, extra of, uh, the proliferation of these cells? Mm -hmm. um, so for the sequencing, we mm -hmm. use the sample from the, the tumor and sample from the normal tissue. Usually it's blood to correlate the the, the the alteration that we find to see whether they already in the whole genome of the patient or they are only here in this specific part of the cancer. And then, like, we sequence both and map mm -hmm. them and taking out some of the, the genes that are associated with the normal human being and only focus on those that are related to the tumor. So you don't expect there are any cells in, that, in the cancer that are maybe, well, maybe they co-develop with the cancer? Uh, which are not seen in, 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 maybe you can also find some deviations in the cells that are developed in the cancer that are not found in a healthy person. Mm -hmm. Is that not a possibility, do you think? You mean like mutation that happened in this part yeah. of, in this specific patient, but it's not related to... So can, can, cancer specific, but not related, directly related to the proliferation of the cancerous cells mm -hmm. that you do not find in a healthy person. Yes, it was not only proliferation, but also something like the, the DNA damage repair and also the, um, let's see, the histone methylation and mm. all of that. So it's not just the proliferations of the cell, but also other processes that ha can happen inside the, the cell. Mm -hmm. So you're very sure that this, the genes that you find are strictly related to the cells that are proliferating and leading to the, to the, yeah, the damaging effects? Pretty much, Pretty yes. Much. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but just, uh, because, and then, uh, of course, based on these um, um, genes and, and the effects, you have proposed a lot of drugs that could be helpful in, in treating the cancerous uh, disease. Um, I have two questions with respect to these uh, drugs. Um, so these are just, well, known drugs, so that's the repo for you, for EU uh, ID, of course. But, uh, I mean, you list like 71 drugs, but I don't see a clear rationale for which drugs would be most beneficial and, and, which, and which combination. Because that's still, if I make some kind of a random um, uh, cocktail of these drugs, yeah, I mean, what cocktail should I make? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that, uh, that could help us to understand which cocktail we have to make? And, and what kind of dose? I mean, you, you showed several data of combination of two drugs, but what I see, I mean, you, you exceed the threshold of 20%, but I would like to go maybe to 80 to really treat or uh, treat the, the, the cancer. 
we would use 80 percentage for only a single therapy, right? To achieve actually the effective therapy. But when we are combining several drugs, we only use the sub-threshold dose. In this yeah, case, yeah. the tested dose was between 10 and 30 hmm. of the IC. Um, and when we are also applying the, the principles of the network pharmacology, different drugs can act on different members of the same module. So we would expect that when we lower the doses, mm -hmm. we would get lower side effects and a high synergy. So mm -hmm. even no, with small doses, I you agree. Still but get what I saw is that if you maybe you go from maybe five ten percent of the sub threshold, you go maybe to thirty. Maybe the best figure I saw on your slides was maybe forty percent. But I would like to go maybe to eighty. Yes, but this so, is but, a yeah, but how would, how would, uh, what kind of suggestion do you have mm -hmm. to, for, for further studies to, to, make, to make the best selection of the drugs here? Because yeah. it's, it's like, uh, like, one, two, like, like eight different uh, uh, targets and, and 71 different drugs. So where should I start? Mm -hmm. This list includes all the drugs that can be given to any patient. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we do for a patient is that we get the genetic alteration from there and map it to the, the disease modules to see which ones are affected. Mm. And here there are 10 communities or 10 modules at the moment. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that a patient has a mutation in two or three of them. We don't give the whole combination of the drugs, but only those that yeah. can affect the perturbed modules. Okay. Does that... To some extent, uh, I was thinking maybe it would, wouldn't be good then to have some kind of uh, biomarker uh, data of the patients that you would like to treat. The biomarker would that be helpful to maybe get a better understanding of, I thought you maybe was thinking in this direction. Yes, so the biomarker information in this case would be the genetic sequencing from the patient and also our collaborator, they are trying to to develop a method to detect the genetic alteration not only in the tumor, but also in the free uh, circulating cells mm -hmm. inside the blood to see whether they can actually sequence them and get to the information needed without the biopsy. And that, that's something that is possible in the, in the future already now, so that you have the biomarker of a certain patient group, maybe? Of a patient, it's already established. And then combina com in combination with this list of all these drugs. It's already established for the histone mutation. So far, it's established that they can relate the patient whether they have the histone mutation also, like with the blood samples and with the tumor. Hmm. And they could find, I would say, reliable information so far with the, with the blood samples that they can detect the histone mutation. But maybe in the future, they can detect more mutations, not only the histone. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I have one other question, which is more general. And maybe one of your um, paronyms is, is willing to read in number 10? <laughs> uh, proposition 10. A hypothesis can never be proven, only rejected. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I like Karl Popper. And um, so my question is, okay, to what extent do you think you have proven that the network medicine is the way to go to treat uh, cancer? That's a good question. So it's already proven with some of the cell experiment. However, the plan over the next weeks and months to, to test more drug combination to see whether, like at this moment, we are only testing two or three drugs per module and also two modules only. But the next experiments is to, uh, the next set of experiments actually is to, are to, um, validate the drug combination against mm. all the modules in the same time. Mm. We just need to find out how we can combine the whole set of drugs okay. in, on the cell line. Well, I would have liked to ask you how to disprove network medicine, but the time is up, and so I have to ask you at another occasion. I give the back <laughs> word to the prorector. That's for the reception, maybe. <laughs> the next opponent is uh, Dr. Julia Guthrie. She is postdoctoral fellow uh, in structural and computational biology at the University of Vienna in Austria. And she is not here, but she is present online. Dr. Guthrie. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, first of all, for the very clear presentation and the inspiring thesis. And my first question would be, 
because the thesis built on the notion that our current knowledge on diseases is imprecise and incomplete, and this hinders discovery and understanding how to treat these diseases. Um, however, the current approach to identify disease modules and these mechanistic endotypes to some extent rely on some established knowledge bases that are human created that could have the same shortcomings as the current disease databases and disease classifications. So I was wondering if you could elaborate or dream up an approach to include molecular mechanism and cellular function uh, to approximate these molecular um, disease endotypes without relying on the current knowledge bases, like such as pathway databases and so on. Do you have any suggestions of how this could be done and what kind of data you could use for this? Hi, Yassim Ponen. Thank you for your kind words and your question. If I understand it co correctly, you are referring to that to the fact that the available databases are not reliable. How can we improve that? Right. So in, in our work, let's say, especially with the signaling module reconstruction, we had to also include some of the data from those databases. So to understand the, what actually happens inside the cell, we used some of the cake pathways and wiki pathways. However, we haven't used them as they're inter, like as if they are not the whole thing. We only were interested in the parts that are related to, the, to our network. And we couldn't even find all the information to construct the, the network in only CAG pathways or wiki pathways. So we had to go through the, the literature. We searched for like every connection in this uh, network to be able to, to construct the signaling modules. So yeah, the databases are not reliable, but we can use them to some extent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my next question would be regarding the different types of genetic associations that you were using. Um, so the systematic review and meta-analysis includes many papers uh, that identify different types of genetic associations and variations. And I was wondering if when do you then decide what C genes to include, are these genes all considered equal or could there, if, if, if yes and no, and if let's say yes, uh, it, would there be a way to include um, and factor for the type of genetic association or the severity of the variation for particular nodes in the network? The, when we try to rank the genes based, that came from the systematic review and meta-analysis, we rank them based on their estimated frequency. That's basically um, a code that takes into account the number of patients per study and the total number of patients per the whole cohort. And also, there was a random effect um, applied in this uh, meta-analysis to correct for the study heterogeneity because not all the studies are performed with only one way of uh, sequencing. Some of them had whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, and so on. Um, so we have these estimated frequency and that's what we use to rank the genes because it takes into account the whole cohort and also the study heterogeneity. So let's say four patients were found mutated in one, of, in one gene in a cohort of 100 patients doesn't equal four patients in 20, right? Yes, what I was more so alluding to is when variation happens on a genomic level and then it's translated on a protein level, the consequences of this genetic variation can be quite different. And how, is there a way to factor this in? Let's say I could imagine that, let's say a variation that you see in a particular gene is quite common because it is actually not that detrimental for the underlying protein. And so you find it in, in many of the patients. However, some uh, variations could be more damaging to the protein. So you find it 
let's say less patients, but they that they could be more detrimental to the molecular network region that they actually affect. If if there could be, you think there could be a way to factor this in in constructing the disease module. Yes. Um... So we believe that the genetic alteration happening on the level of the DNA, those are the first thing happens inside the cell. And the transcriptomics, the proteomics, everything else are secondary. Because what, what started the, the whole process is the damage that happened to the DNA. And when we modulate the, the disease module affected in this case, we are either targeting the same genetic alteration or some neighboring proteins to get it back to somehow normal to the, to close to the normal state. And when we correct the cause, the secondary things will also be corrected. That's what we expect. Okay, um, thank you very much. And um, finally, um, I was wondering, um, because both diseases that are, um, mentioned and showcased in your thesis uh, are cancers. Uh, but then ideally this, this approach would be extended to include many different types of diseases. I was wondering along these lines, are there any specific considerations that you have to take into account when you work with genetic associations uh, of cancer versus other types of diseases? and what these considerations could be. In our lab, we are on, not only working on cancer, but also some chronic diseases, for instance, um, Alzheimer, Parkinson's and epilepsy and many others like HFPF also, right? And when we try to do the same workflow or to apply it to the chronic diseases, there were one problem, one major problem that encountered us. Uh, which is the fact that in the chronic diseases, there are no, the, the genetic information available is not matching to the level of the cancers. And they are not usually done by a whole genome sequencing or a whole exome sequencing. However, they are basically GWAS studies. So when we try to compile everything from GWAS studies, we needed to correct, like instead of the number of patients, we needed to correct that for odds ratio or something else. And you think that, let's say, these GWAS-based genetic associations would have the same kind of weight as a somatic variation in a cancer that you see? So you, you would, of course, after filtering that you do, then you would include both of these genetic associations in the same way in the disease module, or would you consider them quite different? For now, that was the idea, to, to include the SNPs that are coming from the GWAS uh, studies, to relate those to the, um, the closest genes and use those genes to construct the network. Okay, thank you very much. I think I am pretty much out of time, so I would give back. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Guthrie. <clears throat> the opposition will be continued by Dr. Stine Menzel. She is working in the neuroscience lab at the University Hospital Esse in Germany. Dr. Menzel. Thank you, dear candidate, for the concise and uh, nice um, presentation. And I first want to start with a slide of imaginative um, question. So about the first uh, chapter or the second um, about precision medicine. So could you speculate on what would a doctor in this kind of, uh, so you're talking about sorry, uh, mechanism-based classification. And there are patients that are like stress-induced or psychosomatic with a lot of symptoms, but you cannot find a molecular mechanism. Could you speculate what medicine should do with them in your kind of topic? So. Yes, so what we have seen so far, especially in the chronic diseases, mm -hmm. is that the patients are treated according to the symptoms that yeah. are shown, right? Yeah. For hypertension, for instance, we give them vasodilators, diuretics, and we are not treating the, the cause. 
What we propose in those two chapters is to redefine the diseases, to look into the causal mechanism, not just the symptoms that appear in those patients. And by knowing the causal mechanism, we can then treat them and actually cure them. So we, we need to go into depth into what's really happening in the disease state to lead to the symptoms that appear. Maybe the same symptoms can appear, but different causes are there. So but you we think don't know. we don't find it right now, but maybe in the future? Or? So in our lab, we already defined the subtype of, of a subtype of hypertension. So one-fifth of hypertensive patients, they have a dysfunction in the NOx5. Oh, okay. And also there is a clinical trial for HFBF so. to define one, the ARCOG cluster in those patients and treat them based on that. So hopefully in time you'll find also some cure for that patient. Um, okay, over time is my topic right now. So uh, <laughs> um, my second question is when some disease change over time. So like first there's this pathway, then another pathway and the second and the fourth. And now you have a patient like is the fourth pathway or so is active. How would you intercalate that in your network pharmacology? Because you know the original cause might be a genetic or whatever, but right now it's not active anymore. So would you see that, this change? In cancer, yes, also okay. in chronic diseases. So oh. for, for, the, um, for the clusters that we are studying right now, we have biomarkers for that mm -hmm. to test whether the, that cluster or the disease module already present or not. So if we do the biomarker testing after some time of the treatment, this biomarker is normalized or no longer there. Yeah. We cannot treat them, just keep treating them with the oh. same uh, drug. Um, regimen anymore. We need to change it to the new state that they have right now. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I think the data quality already was uh, discussed. So um, <laughs> I was wondering because um, my did I worked in ophthalmology and I learned that photoreceptors are always active because it's an, in an, it's faster to just inhibit them. And so uh, when a photon hits the photoreceptor, it just yeah, shut down, and so for the, the signal is transduced. And um, I learned that this is actually a quite often happening biological uh, mechanism. And also with proteins, they can be photo, um, um, phosphorylized and then not bind to another one. So kind of negative interaction or a gene is shut down. Would you see that? Because I already, so I, I read a lot of overexpression and changes, but what is about negative? Mm -hmm. So one of the common known uh, cancer genes is the P53. Mm -hmm. And usually the mutation in this gene is loss of function. Ah, okay. So it's not longer working and then it's a transcription factor. So the cell just keep growing, there is no inhibition of the cell proliferation or apoptosis. And the cells will only can grow in this state mm -hmm. and just keep growing. In our list of drugs, we uh, targeted several of the first neighbors of the P53, and that was actually one of the modules that was shown. So the one with the three drugs. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm not sure. This one. The one with the three drugs where each one alone is not effective, however, we... No, I think it's... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. <laughs> three drug I combination, remember. each one of them is not effective, however, the, the combination was synergistic and it can inhibit the growth of the cell line. Okay, so also negative interactions are there, yeah. I think. That's... Then I thank you, candidate, for your discussion. Thank you. You would have time. You would have time for one more question if you have. Um, if not, there was one. If I have time, <coughs> yeah. So, um, just short. Um, you said it uh, in your dis uh, in your talk, right? The the low complexity thyroid cancers, and you you said there yeah, there was this dust ball, and then I I don't know with the method. I'm neurologist, so I'm. <laughs> No clue about the statistics. Um, and then you end up with best genes and deletion of dust balls and you're dividing your subclusters and how does it change the data set? Does you lose some information or would you say you focus more? Or I don't know, can you? 
It's basically a focus more, so yeah. it's at the end the same network. However, mm -hmm. when, we were, we, when we were reconstructing those network, we could only understand the relation between two proteins by the insertion of another protein. Mm -hmm. So some of the, the proteins that were pruned out during the construction of the network were reintroduced oh. so that we can really understand what's happening inside the network. But we haven't introduced like a totally separate protein that's coming from outside the network and put it there. Only those proteins that make sense to help us understand the network that we got at the end. So curative uh, input of you just increase the focus? Increase the focus and also if there is a more prominent protein that can really help us understand the network and that can be also targeted with a drug. Okay. In that case, we can, of course, reintroduce it because it makes sense. And when we reintroduce those proteins, we also checked in the, the giant hair pole, the, the network with all the first neighbors, to see whether it's actually a first neighbor of the proteins from our network or we are just adding it by chance. Yeah. And for 99% of the protein, they were already in the first neighbor network. Ah. So you focus, not lose. <laughs> Thank you. So now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Menzel. The opposition will be um, continued by Dr. Eshan Pishwa. He is assistant professor in psychiatry and neuropsychology at Maastricht University. Dr. Pishva. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations for your nice thesis and uh, thanks for the very clear presentation. I've got questions quite in line with the uh, question that Dr. Gotter asked you, one of the questions that um, it's about that I see that you are basing everything and the starting point is a structural variations right, in chapter five and six and in general, right? Uh, however, we all know that structural variations doesn't mean differential protein expression. And then you translate structural variations to protein-protein interactions. Uh, my question is that given the known transcriptional, post-transcriptional modifications, translation, post-translational modifications, how are you sure that what you're finding in a structural variation is reflected at the protein level? Do you think that it is necessary to implement this kind of information also in the network that you construct at the base first place? If no, please tell me why. And if you think yes, please let me know how it is possible. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the nice words and for the question. Indeed, the type of the genetic variation can affect the, the proteins, let's say, later on. And that was also corrected in, in the, the method that we constructed the network, because while we were reconstructing the signaling modules, we gathered information regarding the effect of each variant on the cancer study. So for each mutation that were considered, all the list of the mutations that were considered to build or to be used as seeds, I personally, I gathered all the information needed to, to understand what's really happening in thyroid cancer related to each of those mutations. And I could understand like whether it's an inhibition or activation or loss of function and so on. Also, the fact that the sequencing for the patients and for the primary cell lines that will be produced, um, it's not only DNA sequencing, but also RNA sequencing will be involved. So we would see whether really the DNA change would lead to a change also in the RNA or not. Is it included in the pipeline that you are introducing in chapter five and six? Not in this state, but it will be included because the next step is to develop primary cells from patients and test the drug combination in those uh, primary cells. And if, when our drug combination works, we will go to the clinic with a clinical trial. So with the primary cells and the samples from the patient, we, need, we will do uh, DNA sequencing, a whole exome sequencing, and also RNA sequencing to see whether really the RNA changes with the change of the mutation. Okay, and then my question is that why already at this stage you won't include this information because there are 
huge databases that about the, the gene expression, protein expression, also like post-translational and post-transcriptional information available for many types of cancer. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't you include this information in, at the first place to construct the modules and then cluster them? What's the reason that at this stage you won't include those information? Honestly, we have our own workflow at this moment, and then we ask also our collaborators, the bioinformaticians, to build mm -hmm. another workflow and come up with a combination of drugs that can be given to each of the cell lines at this step. And we were considering to compare the results from our own workflow and their results with the drug combination that they will provide us for each cell line so that we can compare the results and see which one is best. And mm -hmm. in their workflow, they will be including all the information that's available, that's okay. for sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, in chapter four, you have um, included in your thesis, which is um, providing a platform called CADI, or how do you pronounce it? I don't know if it's... CADI. Uh, I already see that the selection of the seed genes there is using more sophisticated and more comprehensive methods. And then I was surprised that like when you're moving to uh, like chapter five and six, you have not followed exactly what is being used there. Was that also a specific reason for that? Yes. Um, so in CADI, they followed like the, the common practice where they include almost all the databases available mm -hmm. and you choose which one to go with. And um, like in CADI, to start building a network, you need to define a specific database to start from for the disease, for the interactome that's used, and also for the drugs, if I remember correctly. So you need to... And tissue spe specificity And tissue from specificity GTEx. for each, like, which cancer you want. And they can also involve, like, different cancer types to see whether they are, there is an overlap or not. But in CADI, you have to choose only one database per selection. You cannot okay. use all of them at the same time. I so see. you need to go with one of those databases and work with it. And when we, like, CADI was before the, the workflow. So it was like a previous step. When we tried to use CADI actually for DIBG and for thyroid cancer, the overlap with the set of seeds, especially for DIBG, because DIBG was only in one of those databases, not for the four. Okay. And when we tried to, to build the DIBG network with CADI, one of the most important genes, which is the plate derived platelet-derived growth factor receptor, it was not identified by the CADI. And when we tried to explore more the reason, mm -hmm. so I went through the database that report the DIBG in there, and actually there was a problem like with their reporting of the data. Because they say that they, we, extracted, we extracted the data, the genetic data from different papers, and here is the list of the paper, but when you go to those papers, the list doesn't match to the one that was provided by the data set or by the database. That's why we wanted to do it on our way. Okay, thanks for your explanation. Um, my final question is that, so you have a, a nice diagram that uh, how you prune the drugs after the selection, so based on a lot of criteria, that you have a flow chart. Yes. I was wondering that, so, uh, just a classical pharmacogenomics, okay, so genetic variations might also influence the, um, the drug targets, the binding sites, huh? and the ligands, and, and that might even cause adverse effects in a subpopulation of the patients. I was wondering that where this information can be also implemented in the whole pipeline, in the very earliest stages or like final? It's also implemented, but in the later stage with okay. the primary cells and the clinical trial because the sequencing will also look for the genes that are responsible for the metabolism of the drug or whether like a person has a specific phenotype related to the metabolism of the drug. So it's, it's actually also implemented in the pipeline, but in later stages.
okay. not with the cell lines. Thank you. This is my final question. <laughs> so you already mentioned like that how moving from cancer to Alzheimer's disease or like neurodegenerative disease might be problematic due to the what you have explained because we have a different type of genetic variations there and finding um, the most important genes might be a bit problematic. Um, what do you suggest? What do you think that how would help that, that, that when, we, when you're moving to the Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease to select the most important genes? Mm -hmm. So I believe it will be based on also the high frequency, the, the genes that have high frequency in the... What? <laughs> Mrs. Mamdou, you have heard that the time for defending your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality in particular of your defense. And please await our return with the results of that deliberation. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Take the mileage,
And of course, taking into account, thank you very much, André, <laughs> and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. And your um, supervisor, Professor Schmidt, is authorized to confer upon you the ac academic distinction in accordance with Dutch University Custom and Law. And I invite now your supervisor to take the floor. Professor Schmidt. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible, doctor candidate? <laughs> yes, I promise. <laughs> by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you Zainab Mohammed Mamdu Abdel Karim Guma, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university, which I hopefully don't break. <laughs> Dear Zainab, congratulations from me as well and in the name of the whole PPM group. You are our third Egyptian PhD here in Maastricht, after Mahmoud, who is online, I assume, and Ahmed, Ahmed who is even here in person. <laughs> I'd say this has been a string of successes that considerably advanced our group, with Mahmoud from mice to men, with Ahmed from small to big data, and with you, Zainab, from ROS and Cyclic GMP to all kinds of signaling mechanisms, not pathways, and cancer. You also followed the process of doing this initially outside of proper funding in our CancerNet collaboration, but then we persistent getting funded in Ripple4U platform as an important part of several work packages and even into clinical trials. I think it was for all of us an amazing moment when after many years of work, totally outside the box, no genetic database, no pathways, using the supposedly outdated first neighbor method, not stopping at PPI modules, but moving to signaling modules, we for the first time saw the data from our Radboud collaborators in cancer cells, module per module, it worked, it worked, and it worked again. Hard work, and since you came here for, with your entire family, 
all the obligations of a young mother came on top, plus the shock coming not only to a new country, but a totally different culture. I can only imagine how this must feel since my moves to the US, Australia and the Netherlands were always cultural changes, but not nearly as dramatic as yours. I trust that you will have seen a good bit of Europe when you eventually have to return to Egypt, some things you will prefer at home, some abroad, and ideally you will be able to amalgamate them for yourself, your future work and your family. Looking into the future, I'm very happy that you can stay with us for a few more months to also do your first postdoc with us and hopefully support the start of our clinical trials. I've given you already your PhD certificate signed by the entire Corona and the certificate by Menz. <laughs> but as Steve Jobs used to say, there is one more thing. I could not notice during our daily huddle meetings that one item in the Snoopiest bowl was your favorite. <laughs> Ferrero Küsschen, klassisch. <laughs> Ferrero Kisses, classic. I once deviated for a month to a different version. Big mistake. Well, may you never run out of Ferrero Küsschen and to always remind you of our huddles, here are the official fan souvenirs from the year when Ferrero Küsschen was introduced to the market. The next market entry celebration will hopefully be when you see your cancer therapy working in first patients. Thank you for working with us. Thanks, <laughs> Esteemed Dr. Mamdu, Dear Zainab, um, it's my great pleasure to congratulate you with your doctorate, and I do that also on behalf of Maastricht University. And I would like to share some impressions of the committee with you. Um, we have seen and enjoyed a very clear, concise presentation of, the su of a summary of your thesis. And I hope that also quite a lot of people here present and on the live stream has understood what you did. Um, your thesis, we think it is a, we enjoyed reading it, and it is a good example of continuous work. It demonstrates a series of, of, under, of, un, of connected and evolving studies, and these studies were all well performed. And your defense, you very well answered most of our questions. Uh, responses were clear and, uh, and, and good, made sense. You clearly demonstrated that you are mastering your topic very well, and we are very satisfied with your defense. I would like to congratulate not only you, but also your two uh, supervisors with this result. Um, just a, a body of, of well-performed studies and uh, a very good thesis and very well defended here. So I congratulate you, Professor Harold Smith and Dr. Christian Nogales Calvo. Congratulations. And of course, I would like to congratulate also um, your husband and your little daughter, and also your parents and other family members. Um, congratulations with your uh, excellent family member. Um, I also include your colleagues, of which I think that a number of them are here in the aula. And uh, I'm qu also quite sure that a number of uh, other group of um, family members and, and friends and also colleagues will have watched the live stream. Um, so again, congratulations you all with, uh, with this uh, effort. Um, I would like to thank all the members of the degree committee, and in particular, the, also the external members, 
And I thank you for critically reading the manuscript, and I uh, especially thank the external members because Maastricht University appreciates your contributions to uh, this committee. Um, before I um, end this um, academic session, I would like to invite uh, one of our members who is present online, uh, Dr. Julia Guthrie. If you like, I invite you to congratulate the young doctor. Uh, both on your work during your PhD, this vast and extensive and very inspirational topic that you have chosen for your field of study and for your defense today. And enjoy your very well deserved title. Um, and I wish you all the best in the next steps of your career. We'll definitely be watching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I enter ceremony, I would like to invite you and your power and and we take a picture here when Dr. Guthrie is still online on screen. So we take um, a picture of the committee first and then a, a picture with your close family. And then we will go to take a second picture in the hall on the stairs. Hereby, I close this academic ceremony at Maastricht University. Thank you.